go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, thank you so much for being here for this uh, Bible study. I hope you've had a great day. I see all you of you did not wash away yesterday, last night. We had a good rainstorm, stormy time yesterday, but uh, it was not as serious as it has been in the past. Tornado warning went off. Well, it went in the area, but it must have been in clouds. So it did not come down. That was that was good, but a lot of water. That's all good. We got a beautiful afternoon this afternoon. I'm glad we decided to spend it in the Lord's house, and I pray that He'll touch us and give us uh, some new knowledge and draw us closer to Him today. We're going to be back where we were uh, a few weeks ago. I appreciate so much, Brother Tyson, filling in last week and. And uh, teaching for me, he did a great job. We got to listen to it on the way back from uh, our trip to Savannah last week, almost to Savannah. So uh, we got to hear most of it, so we enjoyed it. He done a great job, and I appreciate him being willing to step up and, do that and, uh, and teach for me while we were out. Uh, we had a, had a good trip, safe trip, and we're glad to be able to make it back. Uh, but before, so we'll be in Revelation chapter number 20 tonight. Back there, I'm gonna try to finish this up, uh, this teaching up on the millennial reign, and try to touch on or cover the white throne judgment, the great white throne judgment as well tonight, and then we'll move on to another topic next week. But uh, before we get into that, I know there's several on our prayer list and many that need prayer tonight, and we're gonna take prayer requests and and ask the Lord to touch them. Uh, any special prayer requests tonight? that same thing that's going on. Okay. Let's remember Tom Cunningham. Yeah. yeah. Loretta Shaw. Okay, let's remember her family. Is that the, the lady? That's the lady that has one okay. Katie. Katie Shaw. So let's remember that the Shaw family. Uh, just found her passed away this afternoon very suddenly, so uh, remember that family. Also, please remember the Nolan family. Um, brother Jeremy Strickland and his wife Sandra Strickland. Sandra, um, her mother, suddenly and unexpectedly passed away Sunday morning, just passed away in her sleep during the night. She was 63 years old, and didn't have a whole lot of, uh, didn't have any health issues to speak of, and just passed away in her sleep. So very sudden, and not too long ago, about a year ago, they lost a, uh, a cousin to a tragic car accident, so they've been they've been through some storms. So y'all pray for them, pray for the Nolan family, the Strickland family, and uh, pray that God will just give them some comfort during this time. They're, they're really taking it hard, so please pray for them. the Ford family. Okay. Let's remember that family. Any other? Uh, the entire community of Ellisville and Ellis and Lane. Yeah. Miss Lane passed away. My dad was the Jack Cat family. He was the owner of Hudson Barbecue, yeah. correct? And uh, during that storm that come through that day up in that area, he pulled over and pulled just to get out of the storm and a tree fell on his car passed away. So pray for them, pray for that whole community. Any others? Tonight? Maybe some unspoken requests, any unspoken you know, all over the house. I'm glad God hears our requests when we bring them to him, but I'm also glad he knows what we need even before we ask it. And, uh, and even those things that we don't feel liberty to, to ask someone, he knows about it. And uh, we can just talk to him about it and he'll, he'll help us through it. 
Any others? Pray for the law enforcement, especially. We need to be praying for them every day. And pray for their family as well as they, they um, stress and, and worry about them as they go to work. I, I don't know if I would be to stress about my what my wife does or what she what her husband does, uh, you know, for work. But that, that's a, the role of a law enforcement officer. So let's, let's pray for them and their families. Pray for our government. Keep them in your prayers. Pray that God will move in our government. Amen. I tell you what we need in Washington. We need God just to save a bunch of them. Amen. If they'd all get saved, we'd be in a whole lot better shape. And uh, I know there are some Christians there and those that are that are following the Lord, but they're far and few between. So let's pray for pray for them. Pray for our government. Pray that God would just even without them knowing that God them to make decisions would be good for the church. Amen. Any others? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and uh, remember these requests. And ask Him to pray with us, be with us during this study. Remember our youth as they uh, enter into that time of study as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today as humble as we know how. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for protecting us and allowing us another time to be in your house. Lord, I thank you, I thank you so much for all these that came out tonight, Lord, that to be fed of the word. I just pray that, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, through your word, you'd feed them, Lord, that you give them knowledge, Lord, give them understanding of what we'll study tonight. Lord, help us to draw closer to you, and Lord, uh, be a better witness in this world when we're posed with questions from those that may not know or don't have a relationship with you. Lord, we would be equipped to answer those questions and give an answer of the hope that is in us. Lord, the Bible says be ready at any time to give a a, a, a re response to the hope that we have in us. Lord, help us do that. Be strengthened in that tonight. Lord, we just pray for every request that's been mentioned tonight. We pray for those families that are hurting tonight because they've lost loved ones. Lord, there's so, so many around us that's lost loved ones. Lord, we just pray that you provide the comfort and the healing. Lord, the grace that they stand in need of. Lord, give understanding, Lord, when it's needed. Lord, when understanding can't be given, Lord, just pray that you give grace. God, and just pray that you touch them. God, we pray for those that are sick and afflicted. Lord, we pray for those that are in law enforcement. God, we pray that you touch them, protect them, put a hedge around each and every one of them. Pray for their families, Lord. Just give them peace and comfort. Lord, to know that you're watching over them. Lord, you'll keep them safe. God, we just pray for our government. God, we just pray that you would just touch them. Lord, I pray that you just convict their hearts, Lord, and draw them under a relationship. God, I pray for our president, Lord, that just uh, allow him to make good decisions, Lord. Lord, I don't necessarily agree with him, but Lord, I do pray for him and ask you, Lord, to, to touch our country. Lord, I pray that you bless this great country, Lord, and keep us where we need to be. Lord, draw us back to you. Lord, I see all around, Lord, you're moving. I see you moving here, but Lord, if you're moving here, I know that you can move there. You can move all over this country, and we pray that you would. God, be with our youth tonight. Lord, let us plant seeds in their hearts tonight that someday might spring up and bear fruit of, of righteousness and of salvation. God, if there's one down there that's lost, and I'm sure that there is in a group that big, 
God, I pray that you speak truth to them tonight. Maybe they'd be tonight saved, even here in this audience that we have. Lord, just draw us. If there's someone that's lost, I pray that you call them under repentance. I thank you for Jesus. Lord, I'm ask you to lead God and direct us. Give me help where I need it. We'll give you all the honor and the praise for all that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Revelation chapter number 20. I got Miss Nicole to pull up our uh, kind of end, time, end times timeline tonight so you can see it. And I think that helps us to kind of gauge in our mind where we're at. For some of you that have not been here that do not did not hear the, the um, explanation of this timeline, I'm going to give it to you real quick. Uh, we see this is a, a timeline of the end times and the timeline of, of uh, what will take place and what, what's the, I guess, the um, line up of what will, ha what will happen. Uh, you see first on the left side, that's Christ's resurrection. That is Easter Sunday morning 2,000 years ago when, when Christ uh, arose from the grave. And that's when the, the, age of the church started. And listen, we're still in the church age at this time. We're still presently in this first little section here. This is where we are. I believe this. I can't hardly reach it. I wish I had a pointer. We're really close to that line where it says rapture, though. We're still living in the church age, and everything from the rapture forward are still things to come in the future. Uh, we are still living in this age. But there is a time coming that's called rapture, and that is a uh, harpazo and the in the Greek, which means to be called away, or to be called out. And that is when Jesus comes back. Uh, he's not coming all the way to the earth. He's just coming back in the air. He's going to call us. Which, that's when we hear that great trumpet sound. And then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the moment, in the twinkling of the eye, we shall be called up together with him. First, those that are already passed away, uh, they will be arisen from the dead. Their bodies, listen, what we're talking about here at the rapture is our spirit's already in heaven. It, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. That's where your spirit goes. Once you pass off this earth, your spirit is in heaven uh, instantaneously. You, you, there is no soul sleep. There is no uh, time. You, you are there in heaven. As soon as you take your last breath here on earth, you take your first one it's spiritually in heaven. But our bodies stay here. We put them in the grave. But at the rapture, those bodies are going to arise they're going to be reunited with the spirit that is coming with Christ for a great reunion in the air. Amen. And then it says those of us that are alive and remain, there may be some of us here today that are alive. We haven't passed away yet. That are alive when that happens, it says we'll be called up to meet them in the air. So we won't stop them from going and they won't stop us from going. If we know Jesus, and let me say this, that happens to all those that have a relationship with Jesus, okay? The only people that are called up at that time are saved people. Saved saints that are passed away. Saved saints uh, that are still alive. And that is just those that have been saved during the church age or raptured at that time. That's called the church will be raptured. During that time, we'll, we'll be in heaven for a seven-year period called the tribulation. If you see that there. And uh, that's, that's where we will spend that awful time. There's, that's broken down into two different sections. Three and a half years of uh, seemingly peaceful time on the earth. Uh, there's going to be great chaos when people leave with the rapture, but the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to calm everybody down. He's going to act like he's bringing peace. And for three and a half years, there'll be somewhat peace. There will still be great, uh, there will still be a lot of tragedies that go on. There, the seals will start taking place at that time. There will be a lot of death during that time. But for most part, it will be kind of a peaceful time in three years. It's a false peace, though. Because at the halfway point, he's going to break that peace treaty. And then the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, is called the great tribulation. That's going to break out. And that's when things are going to get horrible. I'm talking horrible here on this earth. And that's where God will judge this earth, those that are lost. And that will all take place during that seven-year period. The church, those that are raptured, will be in heaven. We will not be a part of that. And I know that there's a lot of people that will say this. Well, I, I, I talked to somebody, and they think we'll be here for that. They think we'll be a part of that. or what, Some people even say we're in that right now. That's false. That is not true. The Bible teaches in plainly. I can't get into all that scripture tonight, but the Bible teaches that we will be pre-tribulation raptured up out of the the church and the main reason I believe that 
is if in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the end time. Well, the first three chapters, it deals with the church. You remember Christ told uh, John, he said, write these letters unto the seven churches in Asia Minor. And he speaks to every church and talks about them. He's talking to the church. Well, then in chapter 4, he says this, I, I heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet that said, come up hither. And he went up and he got to see heaven there for a minute. And then from that time on, the church was never mentioned again until we, we get to read about the, Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb and all later in Revelation. But all that deals with the rest of Revelation deals with is the tribulation period. And that's just scripture proves it there. And there's other scriptures in there that does that too. But, so we won't be here. But, that tribulation period will happen and that, that second one that's pointed down, that is the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? That's when Jesus comes back to the earth to put his feet down back on the earth as a triumphing king coming back to uh, have that last great battle called Armageddon, that's where that takes place at in, in chapter 19 of Revelation. Then he will do away with, with all of the enemies. He will wipe off this earth, and he will, at his second coming, do away with the devil. And that's where we find ourselves uh, in chapter 20. The, the first verse says this, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. All right, so he bounds it. He, he doesn't do it himself. He doesn't have to. He just sends an angel, and he comes down, and he takes the devil, and he binds him in chains, throws him in the bottomless pit, sets a seal on it, and says, for a thousand years, you are, you are in jail. Okay, he is, he is in jail. Yes, ma'am. Are we part of that army that comes back, or is that just angelic beings? No, that's, we're, we're coming back with him at that time. Okay, that's a good, that's a great question. So like as warriors? Yeah, absolutely. As, as we, we're coming back as the saints, and it's, it says he'll be coming back riding a white horse, and uh, we'll be coming back with him. All the saints that are in heaven will be part of that, that, that army that comes. I'm not sure that we'll have to do a whole lot of fighting because Jesus has got all the power in his hand, right? We're just coming back with him to be a part of that, but we will be part of that, that army that comes back. He does what to say. And then this 1,000 years of peace takes place on earth. It's called the kingdom, the millennial reign. It's 1,000 years. And you say, well, how, why do you think it's 1,000 years? I'm not going to read it because I don't want to get bogged down in Scripture tonight. But in the first six verses there, John says 1,000 years six times. He mentions it is a thousand years, a literal thousand years. Some people say, well, it's not, it may not be a real thousand years because the Bible says that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. And we take that. But listen, you can take your Bible literally, okay? It is a literal thousand year reign of Christ. And what it's going to be, I wrote these down, it's literal kingdom. It's his kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is coming. That's going to be his kingdom that he's going to set up up here on the earth. Listen, it's going to be here. It's not going to be in heaven. It's going to be on this earth. The earth is not going to be the same kind of place after all the hap that happens in the tribulation. Uh, there's going to be great earthquakes that rock this world, that break down mountains, and the, the terrain is going to be different. It's not going to be like it is now. It's going to be wiped off. There's going to be great fervent heat that comes and, and evaporates the oceans and a lot of the oceans and it's going to make another water canopy above us and it's going to make us have great weather. It's always going to be 70 and sunny. Amen. Ain't that something? It's going to be great. There's going to be great deposits of, of fresh spring water that's going to redevelop. Remember, they all broke up during the time of the great flood. They were great water pockets, and they all broke up, and that's how part of the way the, the earth flooded during the, the time of Noah. They're going to reestablish, and there's going to be great natural springs, and that's, there's going to be artesian wells all over the, the place springing up. And it, some of you country folks that's ever seen come across, walking in the woods, come across a real artesian well that's bubbling up out of the ground. You know, that's the best water that you can ever have. They're, they're going to be everywhere. So it's going to look different, and we're going to be able to live 
in that peace, uh, live in that kingdom, because we will enter in. I'm going to tell you in just a minute who all is going to be there. But uh, it is actually going to be a time of true peace on earth. How many times have you heard people say this? I'm praying for peace on earth. Or how many times have you ever watched Miss America and they asked her what she was going to do when she took over as Miss America. She said, I'm going to make peace on earth. Listen, it doesn't matter what we do now. We can't have peace on earth because there's sin on earth at this time. And sin causes us not to be able to have peace. It, 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 it is something that is not going to be able to... I mean, listen, we can try all we want, but there will never be peace on earth until that thousand years. But it's actually going to be a true thousand years of peace and tranquility. It's going to be as it was supposed to be under the original creation back in the Garden of Eden. Listen, nobody will die. That's right. People will be born. There will be some death there, but it'll be so very far and so un, uh, uncharacteristic that it, it only happens every once in a while. It'll be because someone, one of those natural bodies will rebel and not worship like they should and God will Jesus will rule with an iron rod and he will swiftly take care of that person. It'll be so rare for someone to pass away there. Can you imagine the population growth? Oh, a thousand years, nobody dying. Yeah. 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 That's where we're going to get through here in just a minute. How many people are there, there's actually going to be? There's going to be a ton. But a lot of people ask this question to, to preachers and people, Bible teachers, and they say this well, if, if God is so awesome, why didn't he? Why didn't he make a perfect a place with perfect conditions without sin, without all this? What's the answer? He did. he did. Absolutely he did. In the Garden of Eden, when he created man, when he created uh, the, all the way up to Genesis chapter number 3, that is what he created. He created a perfect environment without sin, without anything, and then Satan messed it all up. Amen? And he came down. And he caused mankind to sin, and when mankind sinned, then all of humanity fell into sin. And the earth fell into sin. God cursed the earth, and God cursed man. And we've lived under this curse for all this time. Well, during this thousand year reign, God's lifting the curse. He's going to lift the curse on man, he's going to lift the curse on, on, say, uh, on the earth, and everything's going to be restored as it was in the Garden of Eden. Also, what was one thing that that God did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve that he doesn't do anymore. Hasn't done since. Woo. Hey, how many of y'all know that song? And he walks with me and he talks. He does still with us, right? Spiritually. And in, in spirit, he walks and talks with us. But in that thousand years, he's going to literally be there walking and talking. King Jesus is going to be there. He's going to teach us. He's going to inform us. He's going to instruct us. He's going to uh, preach to us each and every day. I'm so envious when I read the Bible, and I know I'm not supposed to be envious, but I do get envious of those disciples that were able to sit and walk with Jesus for three and a half years and listen to him personally. We're going to be, we're going to have a time that we can do that as well. So it's going to be a, a perfect time of, of, pe of peace on this earth. So what's the reason for the millennium to come in the first place? The reasons for the millennium was to redeem creation, of course, because <coughs> the earth was cursed at, at that time of the fall of man. He's going to redeem the earth and redeem this creation. So it is to redeem the earth. It is to fulfill a lot of Old Testament uh, covenants that he made with Israel, that he made with David, and that he made uh, with, with us as well. He's going to, uh, the new covenant, he's going to establish all of those covenants. One of the, let me just give you one. The Daviatic covenant that God made with David. What were some of those promises in that? That from David, there would be a king that would come, right? And his throne would be established and it would be everlasting, right? One of, one of the things was, God said, I'm going to establish in you, David, a kingdom and a throne that will be everlasting. Well, that throne, that throne of David in Jerusalem is going to be established during this thousand year reign, never to be unestablished again. He's also going to bring out of David a king that sat upon that throne, which is Jesus. And we know how Jesus came out of the, the, the line of David. So he'll be sitting on that. So he's reinstating some of these covenants that he made. Another reason uh, for this, for the thousand year reign, is for God to prove a point to him. What do a lot of people 
complain on sin these days. The devil. It's his fault for everything, right? So during that thousand year reign, he's going to be in jail. He's going to be ca chained, cast up. Listen, they will be no devil. Amen. They will be no devil to get after us and to uh, afflict us and to tempt us and to do all those things. Praise God for that. Because he does do that now, amen? Tomorrow, or even when we walk out of here tonight, he's going to start attacking some of us, maybe all of us, and try to get us off track. But in that thousand year reign, he won't be able to do that. He will be bound and, and put away. So there will be no devil. So we won't be able to, to, to blame anything on the devil, right? What else do we say? Yes. But will he himself still target specific people, or does he stay in God's ear telling them what our transgressions are constantly? Okay, you're talking about present. Yeah. yeah. No. You may ask that another time. No, uh -uh. That's, that's a perfect question. Now, he does have henchmen. He has demons that he does. One of the places he does, he does come and, and move to and fro in the earth. Job chapter 1 says that he asked, God asked Job, said, Job, where you, or Satan, where have you been doing? So I've been going to and fro from the earth to there. But one of his places that he does reside is still in heaven. He's there. The Bible gives one of the names for the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So he's there accusing us. He's there accusing and, and saying, God, you see what your son did? I'm going to use me as an example. Did you see what Kevin did today? Did you see he's accusing? He said he's sinned and he got out of the way. So he's accusing us there. But you know what God says to everybody that's been washed in the blood? He looks down and he says, that's nothing been paid for. It's, it's, it's washed away. It's all and under the blood. Absolutely. That has been paid for. That debt's been paid. But he is the accuser of the brethren. But he does come and, and makes that, that different place where he, he uh, afflicts and, and does other But he does have many other angels and, and demons that goes and, and do that. Uh, so, but what is another reason that we blame on us to sin? We, we blame the devil, but what else do we blame? Other people. other people, there you go. Everybody else is going to be perfect like us as well, or in a perfect environment. All right, listen, we're, those of us that have glorified bodies that's been raised at the rapture, we're going in. Let me just give you who's going to be there. Raised saints that's been raised, that's been raptured, that's came back with Christ, we're entering it. All of us will enter it. There will be those that were that died during the tribulation, Jews, and those that, there will be some saved during the tribulation. I know there's a lot, and I don't have time to get into that tonight, but there will be people saved during that tribulation time. There will be martyrs, people that are beheaded during that time of Christ. They will enter in. They will be raised up after Enter in with glorified bodies. There will be people, Jews and some Gentiles, that endure, that survive. Some Jews that God hides away. He's going to hide them in a place. He's got a remnant. That he's going to hide in a place called Petra. Has anybody ever heard of Petra? I know Miss April has. We talked about it last week. Petra is a place. Let me ask you this. How many of y'all have ever seen Indiana Jones? The last one where he goes in and he, he, he rides into this great, it's a red black cave, but it's got a big building on the outside. It's carved into the, the rock. And, and he rides in there and he goes, I forget what he does when he gets in there. I'm not actually sure what he gets at. But the actual place where they filmed that movie is Petra. It is a rock. It is a, and that is a place. It's Petra. It's uh, in Moab. That's what the old Moab and they, he's going to hide those Jews in that rock, in that very place for Indiana Jones. I mean, that's actually going to be where he hides them in that rock there during the trip. Keep them safe. They will, those that endure, Jews, some Gentiles that endure, they will enter into the kingdom in natural bodies, okay? They never die. They haven't passed away. Yet. So they're going to enter in bodies like us. I know it's getting a lot for you, and I'm trying to not to overwhelm you there. But they're going to enter in. And then that's who all is going to be there. But we, we 
blame our sin a lot of times on other people. What did they make me do? They made me so mad that I got out in the flesh. How many of y'all ever said that? Ooh, I got I to gotta make a, a confession. How many of y'all ever get in the flesh in, in, in the track? Sunday we went up to, to Top Golf. We was driving, I had to drive that bus up there in Atlanta in the middle of that traffic. And about two or three times I had to catch myself because I almost got in the flesh without some of them folks driving. Or they don't know how to drive, y'all. <laughs> it might have been me too, though. But, but uh, anyway, but we say people make us sin. Well, in that time, there'll be perfectness. Most people will be in, when glorified bodies that can't sin. Those that are there, they'll have, they won't, there'll be good justice and peace and love with each and every one, so they won't be out. But what's another reason that we say we sin? Not just people and not the devil. It's the environment that we're in, right? Well, I was in this environment. Uh, I, I got caught up with all my buddies, and they was doing all this stuff, and that environment just sucked me in. And listen, that does happen, amen? That happens. You get in the environment of sin, sin will suck you in. That's why we always preach and we encourage not to get in those situations. Huh? Yeah, it's kind of like my phone just sucks it in. I had to tell that story a little bit later if anybody knows it. My phone got sucked out the window driving down the road Sunday with that bus. But praise the Lord, he put a hedge of protection around it. 70 miles an hour down the road, just laid it in the grass. And I got to go back and find it, pick it right up. That was just God right there. But it will suck you in. Sin, that, that environment will suck you in and cause you to sin. Well, God is one of the reasons for the millennium was him, for him to prove a point. That it'll be a perfect environment. Be just like the Garden of Eden, where there was no sin. We know Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden in a perfect condition. Without anything, they sinned. Well, it's going to prove a point that it's not uh, that man's heart. What does it say in Jeremiah? Jeremiah says this about man's heart. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. He's proven a point that man's heart is actually wicked. It is man that needs to be renewed because we, even in a perfect environment, some men will still, and men and women will still choose to sin because we're going to see what happens in a minute. That, that man will, will, will still mess up, even in a perfect environment. So we have to be regenerated. We have to be renewed in the spirit and, and with the blood of Christ for us to be, re, to be made perfect. What's going to keep this perfect environment from falling in? Because there'll be, it, there will be, this is going to be a, a, a theocracy, all right? Uh, it's not going to be a democ uh, democracy. A democracy is when everybody decides what they want to do, and when the majority decides, then they do it. That's why we cannot control the moral things, because we get enough crooked people in government, they can decide abortion is okay and abortion is legal. And the devil's not going to be there. That's right. That's one thing that will keep it from falling. The devil's not going to be there, but it's also going to be a theocracy or a monocracy. It's going to be like there's a king, okay? King is in control. Jesus Christ is the king. And he's going to rule everyone with perfect justice. And we're going to obey. There's going to be ob obedience to that all the time. And like Clyde said, the devil won't be there to mess it all up. Even those perfect, even those people in our body, they will be subject to obey what God says. And they will, they will do that during that time. So we won't be in that, that environment that will cause us to sin. But at the end of this thing, do y'all remember? Let me read this to you. Uh, we're going to finish this part up. It says, in that verse, it says, They bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. I'm in verse 3 of chapter 20. And shut him up and set a seal upon him. But he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And then after, he must be loosed for a little season. Now, that is one of the verses that makes absolutely no sense to me. If me and my mortal mind, I cannot understand why in the world God would turn him loose again. But he says in that verse, at the end of this thousand years, after we, after we live, after we've had this perfect environment, 
that he's going to let God, he's going to let Satan out. God's going to turn him loose for a, for a little season. And he's going to be able to go throughout all that perfect environment and deceive and see if he can deceive and draw him another arm. And, and that is exactly the purpose of life. That he is, the reason being is God gives everybody a choice, right? It's, he, it's his desire that all men be saved. It is his desire that all men come under repentance. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. But he gives you a choice. Somebody says, that somebody talks about when God sends people, or at the great white throne, when God condemns people to hell, they say, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? He doesn't. He doesn't send anybody to hell. Who sends somebody to hell? The person that makes that choice. He gives ample opportunity to everybody to receive. And you have the choice. You can accept him and believe in what Jesus did on the cross and accept salvation. Or you can say, no, nah, I think I can get there on my own. And when you, get, when you make that choice at the end of this, if you keep that decision, God's going to say, depart from me, ye who work in this, for I never knew you. And it will not be God that sent you to hell. It will be your decision not to re re receive Christ. But those people that are born, and like I said earlier, a thousand years, there's going to be people that are born, and there's not going to be any death. Who knows how long they will be able to give birth. They may be able to give birth a whole thousand years. Who knows? Can you imagine ladies going in and in and being able to, to give birth for a thousand years. How many how many babies could a lady have in a thousand years? I mean, yeah, absolutely. That was one of the things that it was going to be a, a curse, right? Might not be that bad for them. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It says in, in one place in the Bible that there'll be so many people that they'll outnumber the things of the first. Absolutely. Those that are that are perfected us, listen, we're going to go in with perfected bodies. Those that are, are he's not going to get to us, okay? We're, we're un, we're untouchable. Uh, there you go. That's a good word. But we've already made that decision, right? Once saved, always saved. Eternal security. That's eternal. That means there's nothing in this world that can cause you to lose your salvation. There's nothing in that thousand years that can cause you to lose your salvation. And there's nothing in eternity that can cause you to lose your salvation. It's eternal. So you're safe and secure. But those that have not made that choice, God's going to turn Satan out and he's going to let him go. And he's going to travel around this earth and he's going to try to build himself an army. Let me read you a, a something that Dr. J. Vernon McGee said. He told this story. He recalls that there's a Dr. Schaefer. He asked this question. He said, why did God, does God let Satan go again? And this is what Mr. Schaefer said. He said, if you will tell me why God let him loose in the first place, I will tell you why God lets him loose the second time. That's a pretty good answer right there. Why did he even let him come? I mean, why, why didn't he just throw him in that bottom of the pit at the beginning and, and let it off? Who knows? We don't know what the purpose of all of what God does, does what he does, the reason. But without, but without the devil, we, we're never choosing God, right? Like, we're never, we're never in a position to have to choose God. Right. Like, we're never going to choose God if, if, there's, if there's no Satan. Or just that we don't understand that they need Jesus, yeah. that they never really right. provided everything, but God provided everything during that time of the Old Testament, too, and they always forsook him every time they had a chance to right. What's going to take place in that thousand years is each, I don't know how often it's going to be often for most of us, we, we can go to Jerusalem. We can go, just like you did tonight, you came to Essex Baptist Church to hear me teach this. Well, when we get in that thousand year reign, we can go up to Jerusalem and sit in, in, the, in the auditorium and let here, in the temple and hear Jesus teach. Can you imagine that? We're going to be able to do that. And that's going to be required of all those that are in the, the kingdom for us to worship Jesus at certain times, at certain places, all throughout that thousand years. Those normal people are going to outwardly 
obey. They're going because everybody's going. There's nobody going to the lake when it's church day. There's nobody going to the ball field. There, everybody goes to church because that's what everybody does. And they're going to go along. Like, like the the yeah. Oh, what is there to teach? Oh, you know all the questions you got that I can't answer? I, he, he's going to tell you everything, why he did everything. He can tell you that. He's also going to tell us about his goodness and all the things that he's done. He's going to be able to sit and tell stories, I guess. I, I, I don't know. I'm just, this is speculation. We speculate. Lady, he's going to be able to just tell you all about when he was walking on the water and the things that he'd done. But he's also going to teach us and instruct us in righteousness, all right? We're going to be righteous. But he's also going to tell us how to how that hat takes place. I'm not sure exactly what all he's going to teach us, but we're going to go up, and he's going to teach us, and he's going to instruct us, and he's going to preach to us. We're going to worship. Those normal people are going to go because it's what is, is required. But inside, they're going to do what a lot of people do today. They're going to go, but on the inside, they say, man, I wish I didn't have to go to church. Do you know a lot of people do go to church I'm not saying you guys, y'all came on Wednesday night, I'm so thankful. But there is a lot of people that go to church out of obligation. They go because they think they're supposed to go, because that's what they've got to do. It's not because they want to go. It's not because they want to learn anything new about God. It's not because they want to worship. It's just because they go because of that obligation. Now, that's a, probably a lot less in today's time because people don't care. They just say, I'm going to the lake today. I'm not going to the church. Or I'm going so far. Not, nothing bad about going to the lake, amen. Bad about going late. You don't know, you never need to put anything. You know, some people. Well, I'm here. You know, they're going to go. But that's they're going to have to because they're going to be ruled by Jesus. So at the end of this age, Satan's going to go around and some of them, in the perfect condition, in the perfect, I mean, there's no sin, nothing to draw. When Satan comes around and says, don't y'all want to hook up with me? I'll go overthrow him. I do. I hate going up there. I just do it because I have to. I, I'm, I'm going to hook up with you. He's going to make him an army. And it's going to be a big army. Watch all the way up to Jerusalem and surround that temple and try to overthrow him again. Can you believe that? That's what Satan tried to do on the first time. Tried to overthrow God in heaven. God kicked him out. Tried to do mess up everything on earth. God put him in the bottom of the pit. And tried to do it all over again. It's about Satan. He tries hard, right? He don't never give up. He's going to do what he wants to do. But he never... Verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Just like you talked about, Brother Clyde. He is on the earth. It's going to be the sand of the sea. Let me, let me clear this up. Some, so many of you may do this. If you read in Ezekiel, Ezekiel talks about a battle called Gog and Magog. Okay? This Gog and Magog is not the same one as Ezekiel talks about. That happened during the tribulation time. That's what's going to break that peace. They're going to come down. They're going to try to invade Israel and that's going to break that peace. This is a different Gog and Magog. Well, it's kind of the same name as, it, it's kind of like why do we have World War I in World War II. World War I was such a huge war and involved the whole world. The only name they could come up with was World War II. Or World War II. Well, then a few years later, when it broke out again, it was exactly the same thing. It, it, what happened there? So they said, man, it's the same thing, so we're going to call it World War II. So this is kind of the same thing. This is a different Gog and Magog, but it's such a big thing that it's going to be Gog and Magog too. So he, he calls them down. They come around and they surround Israel. 
Listen to what it says in verse 9. And they went up to the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire, listen to this, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That was a great battle, right? That was short and sweet. That, short and sweet. <laughs> that just shows you how much power God had. He didn't even address them. He just sent some fire down. Poof, they were gone. Satan and that huge and it just got together. God just sent some fire down from heaven and it just obliterated them, annihilated them. <coughs> there was really not even a foul fault. God just took care of them. So he defeats him at that time. It is completely defeated. Verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be day and night forever and ever. So this is what happens. Yes. I thought about what you made the comment about how instantaneous it would be. And, you know, that hits my head so many times. Then why even try? Why try? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm asking, why do you even try? It's like because it's not really about the battle. It's about the individual soul that he wants to save. If he gets one, it's a victory. Absolutely. And if I just one. That is a great point. Because it's not, like, like I said, that's a great point. It's not about him winning. He, never, he can't win. He wants to win. Listen, he does, but he's not. But he's got a lot of he, knows he, he knows his destination. He knows where he's going. And he says this, I'm just going to take as many of them people as I can take with me. So that's what he does. That's why, he's, that's why he does it. Uh, so after he He's cast into the lake of fire. This is Gehana. This is the eternal, this is the final place called hell. It's not a hold cell. It's not jail. It's not the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit is kind of, uh, what, what do they call it? If you ever watch it, when the people go to jail, they get, maybe get put in a hole for a few days. You know, it's like, that's where he got put in. But now he's, he's in the death row, or it's worse than that. He's, he's locked away. Lake of fire. He throws him there with the false prophet and the and the beast, and that's where he'll spend eternity and tormented day and night, forever and ever and ever. And so, at this point, all the people who have died and gone to hell have not had their face to face yet. <clears throat> that's right. That's where we're at now. All right, I got five. I can't cover it all. I'm gonna give just to scratch the surface. What we're gonna get into next week. Look, Satan's loose. You see. He's loosed, he's defeated, then there's the great white throne judgment. Now this is a judgment. The Bible says this, it's appointed unto man once to die in the judgment. That means we all stand in judgment one day. It's just according to which one we're going to stand in front of, right? We talked about this, some of you that weren't here, there's a judgment that Christians are going to be done in heaven during that tribulation period while we're in heaven, but it's a bema seat. It's not really a judgment where we're judged whether or not we'll, we'll enter into heaven or hell. It is to receive our gifts or our, our, our crown there. We'll receive our rewards for what we've done here on this earth. The second one is that's where all lost people from all eternity will stand before Christ and be judged. That takes place, those at that time, let me just read the scripture to you real quick. We'll, we'll, we'll get on it. Verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from the whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to, his, to their work. And the lake of fire, this is the second day. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. So who has been 
Who has been resurrected or who has been raised from their bodies have been raised up to this point? Only the same. Only the same. That's the Old Testament. The church has been resurrected and so hard. Those tribulation saints. Just saved people. The only one that's been, been reunited. Now, at this great white throne, all of time, all the time, all the way back, remember when Cain, uh, Abel was, uh, Cain slew Abel, but he, Abel was a righteous person. But from that time, all the way, from Adam's time, all the way up until this, through the thousand years and to this time, the person that has died without Christ will be raised. Bible says the dead, the seas gave them up. I guess them, them sharks are going to regurgitate them or whatever, but whatever they do, wherever they ended up, it says the, the, the sea gave them up. Um, hell gave, gives up everyone that was in them. It says the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So that means every ship that's ever sunk down with it, every person that has ever been eaten or had a tragic death, they are all going to come. All those that have died without Christ through all of it, all of it, the whole history of the earth are going to be raised at this time, and they are going to stand in front of Jesus to be judged. There are going to be two judgments. We're all going to stand in front of one. Either the beam of seat because you're saved, you're going to stand in front of one, or the great white throne because you're lost, and you're going to be judged according to your works. Listen. Not a problem. Not a problem with God. That's right. Just like he put us together in dirt, made us a body, and draw it all back. Every every particle, every molecule will come back together. So they'll stand before Jesus. Or let me say this. Who's going to be the judge to give it away? God. It's, it's actually not going to be God the Father. It's going to be God the Son. Let me tell you why. John chapter five. Jesus' words, man. He says, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment. So it's not be God the Father that actually judges. It's going to be God the Son. It's going to be Jesus Christ. Listen to this. In verse 27, it says in John chapter 5, verse 27, and he hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So we would think it would be God the Father, right? He's going to sit in judgment. Uh, he's going to sit and be the judge, but no, he's going to, he's given all judgment over to Christ to be the judge. Because who did they actually reject in the first place? They rejected Christ, right? Because they ones they, they will give, but he's given judgment unto Christ. And because he's given that judgment unto Christ, and I'm out of time, I'm going to give you just a couple of things, uh, he will be the one that will do the judging. And he'll be the one that will stand in judgment. You'll stand before him because he will execute that judgment. He will be the one to give the judgment. Also it says this, it says they were books, right? How much time do I got? Oh, I got, I'm, a, I'm past time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get... Right. All power is given unto me. Right. There you go. I'm going to give that next week too. I'm get, we will. We will stand in judgment. Oh, we will be able to judge, but who are we going to judge? We're going to judge and follow the angels. Them ones that fail. You're exactly right. We'll stand and judge. We'll be judging those fallen angels that give us a hard time. But listen. We all know about what books. 
the book, Lamb's Book of Life. That's where our names are written down, right? I know my name is written there. When you get saved here on earth, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Huh? The first word. Oh, I ain't got to all of them. That's the one that we all know. But there's more than one book. Okay. <laughs> She's reading. Look at her. This is where this is going to get to. We're going to talk about the books that he reads out of. It says, and I saw the dead in Christ. And the books, books, there's more than one book that he judges us out, or judges them out of, not to say uh, but the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. We all know about the book of life, but what we don't re probably know a whole lot about is those other books that he's going to judge us out of. So we're going to talk about them next week. And I tried, I was going to try to get to all this tonight, but we'll, we'll get it next week. The Great White Throne Judgment. Listen, if you're saved, do not worry about the Great White Throne Judgment, okay? You will not be there. We will be observing from somewhere, and I don't know where we'll be at that time. But you will not stand in front of Christ and be judged on what you did. Because when, we, when Jesus Christ, they're going to be judged according to their sins, their works, which is their sins. And that's what's going to cause them to be cast into, into hell in the lake of fire. Where are we judged? Somebody point to it. But it wasn't actually it was Christ that was good. And when we accepted that, he, he bore our sin on the cross. He was for our sin on the cross. And when we accept what he did on the cross for our sin, then we don't have to stand before him in judgment at all because it's already been judged. Somebody told me this a long time ago. There's a whole lot of difference between scribbling something out and erasing something and blocking something. When you erase something, you still see the indentions in the paper where you where you wrote it. When you scribble something out, you can still see it. But when you blot it out, it's completely gone. And our sins have been blotted out when we accept Christ. The judge. So they will be judged according to their works and different things. We're going to talk about those other books next week. But that, that's something that we'll get on next week. The Daniel's 70th week. Okay. That one's kind of long, but I'll, I'll get that. It, the Dan 70th week of Daniel, and it's called his 70 weeks of, of prophecy, okay? It, most of all of that has taken place. I'll read it to you next week. But there's that one week seven, or that seven sevens, which is seven years, has not taken place yet. What has happened? I'll give you the best. Uh, um, I'll give you the best you for that. Um, Y'all know when you play a basketball game or a football game, you play part of it, and in the very middle of it, they say, "Time out. We got time out. We're gonna have halftime." And you go out and they take a break for halftime. Then after halftime's over, they come out and they say, "All right, it's time to kick off. Go in. We're gonna." Second half. Of Daniel, 69 weeks of Daniel, 460 some odd years, I, I'll get it right next week, have already taken place. The prophecy has already taken place. But then all that God said, Come out, <coughs> and he stopped. And he let the church age enter in. And he gave way for us to be saved. He has given opportunity for us to be saved. Then when the rapture takes place, God's going to come back in. Last seven years is the seventieth week of Daniel. In better, that's what that is part of the problem. That's exactly that's the best description. And when we when he wraps all of us out, he's gonna he's gonna call time in and it's gonna get on. All right. Anybody else got a question or not? Don't don't feel bad because you say, "Well, I didn't get all that. I don't really understand it." I said it again. 
I want you to be to realize you don't have to understand it all. There are theologians that study this as their job every day, and they're still reacting. You don't have to get it all, but just know this, like Brother Tony said, the thing you do need to know makes all the we really talk about is going to be really bad. But uh, you're saved. And we got something great to look forward to in eternity. We just want to give you a little bit of information about what takes place here in eternity. All right. Anybody else got anything tonight before we dismiss? All right. If not, Tonight. Invite somebody to come back with you Sunday. Hey, it's good to have you that, that are visiting with us tonight. Haven't been here very often, but we, we appreciate you so much for coming. Come back next week. Come Sunday. Invite somebody to come with you. And uh, I hope we have to sit in the choir law Sunday. Amen. It's going to be Mother's Day. Let me say this, ladies, if you didn't get Mr. Cole's uh, message, Mother's Day is a tradition around here at Ephesus that where all the ladies wear hats, okay? I'm, some of you ladies can describe what kind of hats you wear. So. That big. Huh? That big. Yeah, that big. Really, Kentucky Derby style hats is kind of what they're what, what we do. You know those ladies get those pretty hats. It's not a cap, it's a hat, as she says. So wear, get you one up, get a pretty one, wear it. Uh, us men, we haven't developed us a, something to do on Father's Day, but I'm thinking about this year to do overhauls on, on Father's Day. They're, all the men wear their overalls. But anyway, you ladies do that. Y'all come and we're looking forward to celebrating all our mothers here on Sunday and looking forward to that. So be, be much in prayer for our service coming Sunday. Anything else tonight before we dismiss? All right. Brother Tyson, dismiss us tonight.